26 years ago, today, I preached the first time in Lafayette. Today is an anniversary for Judy and I being in Lafayette. 26 years. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, that's pretty amazing, huh? I spent the night at Don and Sheila Dowda's house. Judy and I and our kids uh, were there, and uh, it's been a ride. <laughs> Don said it's been a whirlwind. Maybe, maybe it's more of a whirlwind than a ride. I don't know, but it, it's, been, it's been amazing. So I'm going to work that in a little bit today as we talk. But anyhow, if you have your Bibles, you know where to turn, right? Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. We'll start right there. Uh, this will be the ninth time we've read it. Uh, I figure three more times. Three more times. But uh, it's, it's been good and interesting, and I'm hoping you've been enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, you, know, you would assume, would you not, that when Messiah came, that uh, he would kind of scour the earth for the best people to put into the place of the apostles. You would think, would you not, that he would get the most trained, the best trained. He would get the most influential people. He would get those that were really educated and knowledgeable about the word of God. That's what you would think he would get. He would get those kinds of people. He, he would certainly get people from around Jerusalem, right? He would get, he would get people from uh, in the area of Judea. What? Right, you would think so, wouldn't you? I mean, he would just get somebody there that knew what was going on. But he didn't get any from any of those categories. It's, it's really interesting when you look at it. In fact, he did the polar opposite from that. He, uh, he got illiterate fishermen. I mean, not just uneducated, <laughs> illiterate fishermen. Uh, he got a, a tax collector, a public, and we're going to talk about him today. The lowest of the low, the worst of the worst. He got him. He got a, a terrorist. A terrorist was, was an apostle. He got a traitor. And four of them didn't have any jobs at all. I mean, they were just unemployed. I mean, what do you, what do you, I mean, what if, and I was thinking about this, what if he came today? What if, now, now I'm not talking about he came 2,000 years ago. What, flush that, flush, flush his coming, flush that, you know, anything about the scriptures or anything about that, and he comes today in our time. What if? And there's this guy out there, and he says he's the Messiah. And, and he starts selecting his followers, his, his apostles, to follow him. And, and, and leaders of his church. And, and so, and so he's, he's calling these guys, and, you know, he gets these illiterate fishermen. He, he gets this, this scum of scum, this worst person that you can imagine, this most of hated people of all. He gets a, he gets a terrorist. And he... Uh, uh, he gets a traitor, <laughs> you know, uh, and four of them are unemployed. I mean, they just they hadn't done anything in a long time. I mean, these are the people he, what kind of effect would that have on you? Well, I mean, what, would that encourage you to, to believe he is the Messiah? Or would you say, who is this guy? He can't be the Messiah. What would, what would the media do with that? Imagine, imagine with me. What would the media do with somebody calling himself the Messiah and selecting these kinds of people to be the leaders of what he's doing? What would, would, the, would the media have a ball with that? I think what they would say. <laughs> oh, he's done some neat things, but man, look, we've done some checks on these people, and look at them. What would religion do with that? What would religion have fun with that? I mean, would they say, we told you he was a demon? I mean, you can tell he's out of his mind by the people that he selected to, to work with him. But you, how would that affect you? Would that encourage you to think he is the Messiah? Or would it encourage you to think he's not the Messiah? So I, I want us to just think of that. With that, with that in, in mind, let's read our passage for today. Uh, it's the same passage we've had for the last <laughs> eight weeks, but yeah, let's, let's do it again. We're going to get it. Uh, <laughs> Luke 6, 12. One of those days when Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. We talked about that. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. We've talked about that. Simon, whom he named Peter. We talked about him. His, his brother Andrew. We talked about him. James and John. We've talked about them. Philip, Bartholomew. We've talked about them. Today we'll talk about Matthew and Thomas. James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the, uh, the zealot, the terrorist, <laughs> and Judas, uh, the son of James. We'll talk about them next time. And Judas Iscariot will get him one day down the road, who became a traitor. 
So I was thinking, you know, about this. See, this is an elite group of guys. You would not have selected them. I, I wouldn't have selected them. But these are an elite group of guys. And I was, I was pondering that. You know, 27 years ago, 26 years ago, began pastoring here. And it was like eight years before that, I taught the scriptures and preached here and there. Not one time in all of those years, in all of those times that I've preached, have I ever preached about the apostles. I mean, on a focused study of them. Not one time. Flipping that around, this is probably the first time that most, if not all of you, have ever had a lengthy study of the, just the focused on the apostles. Now, this is sad. And this is sad for the reason that, that these are important people. See, see with, without these guys, there would be no church. They're the ones that literally made sure the church got started. Jesus built it, but it was built upon them. They're the ones that are responsible for us having scriptures. Jesus didn't write not one book in the scriptures. The apostles and the prophets wrote those. And so we have that. But beyond that, it's because of them that salvation is offered to me. And salvation has been offered to you and to our children. It's because of them. So these are very, very important people. And we, you know, we're just going to take some, we're taking time and looking at them. So today we're going to talk about Matthew and we're going to talk about Thomas. We've already talked somewhat about Matthew and his conversion back in Matthew chapter 5 a couple of years ago. <laughs> When, when we were there. <laughs> but, but I'm just going to hit kind of the high points with it. Now, Matthew is a common name, don't you think? I mean, some of you are named Matthew. Uh, some, of you, <laughs> some of you have relatives named Matthew. Uh, it's, a, it's a common name, but it goes back to this person, this Matthew the Apostle. This is where the name goes back. But Matthew was also called Levi in the Scriptures. He was a tax collector. And uh, when he was called by Jesus, he was a tax collector, and the, new, and the King James Version says publican. And when you read about publicans in the scriptures, they're always publicans and sinners. sinners. <laughs> they're always connected there. And the reason is, is they're actually worse. They're, they're before the publicans, which gives them superiority. They're better sinners than were the sinners. Publicans and sinners. They were the lowest of the low, the scum of the scum. They were, they were the bottom of the barrel in society. Uh, maybe to get our heads wrapped around it a little bit, think of, in our society, think of a molester. Think of a rapist, somebody who takes advantage of weaker people. Think of a, a man who abuses his wife, abuses his children. Think of, think of somebody like that and then put the publican, the tax collector of that day, under it. Now, we don't like tax collectors, but we, they hated them. They were at the bottom of the barrel. They were the worst of the worst. And they weren't only hated by Jews, they were hated by everybody. You would have hated them. And the reason you would have hated them is because they were dishonest people and they were mean people. They worked in a, a mafia atmosphere. They were considered traitors, traitors to the Jews, but traitors also to their own family. Here's why, is they would take money from their own nation, people of their own nation and from their own family and give it to Rome who was coming to rule over them, to occupy their land and to rule them. And they were considered traitors. They hated them because they did that. These tax collectors did that. Religion hated them. Religion wouldn't let them come to the temple and sacrifice. Even if they were a Jew, they could not come and sacrifice because, because the religion says they were doomed for hell. They couldn't go to church, which the synagogue, which is the Old Testament version of the church today. They couldn't go. They couldn't worship God. They were, they were cast out, cast away. They could not participate in the legal system of the Jews. They couldn't even go and witness for somebody or against somebody. They couldn't bring litigations because they were, they were just no good. They were doomed for hell. They were rejected. They were, they were the bottom of the bottom. They were the worst of the worst. Hear me. They were the most hated people in town. Matthew was the most hated man in Capernaum when Jesus called him. Scum of scum, worst of worst, most hated, but yet Jesus calls him. When I, when I taught this lesson back then, I titled it, How Low Will Jesus Go? How low will he go? I don't know, how low are you? How low were you when he came and got you? 
That's how low he'll go. There, there is no limit to how low he will go for a soul. Let me introduce you here to Matthew. In Matthew chapter 9, in verse 9. Now, notice this is the book of Matthew, the gospel of St. Matthew, and we're reading about Matthew. Okay? Matthew 9, 9 says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Now, I want you to see, Matthew is writing about himself. This is his experience, and he calls himself Matthew. This is his conversion. This is his calling. He, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he, Jesus, told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, Luke is writing about the same experience of the same person, but notice how what he calls him. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. So is he Levi or is he Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> he, he is. He's both. And I want to talk about that in just a second, just pointing this out. Named Levi. Now what's interesting is, leave that up, because here in, in Luke 5, he calls him Levi, but in Luke 6, where he's naming the apostles, he calls him Matthew. So who is he? <laughs> Levi, sitting at his tax booth, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left what? Left what? Left. Can, I, can everybody read out there? Left what? Okay. Left everything and followed him. <laughs> yeah, if you couldn't read, I was going to say you might be a, make a good apostle. But that was, that's <laughs> Left everything and followed him. Now. What I'm wanting to see here is that this is the same guy having the same experience, but here one guy calls him Levi, another guy calls him Matthew. And I think it's that Simon Peter deal, you know? It's this Simon who went through the conversion and became rock, Peter. Simon Peter. Uh, Nathaniel Bartholomew. Uh, you know, and we've got James and John, the, son, the sons of thunder. And, and there, there's this transformation that, that happens when Jesus calls you. Levi becomes Matthew. Levi was the, was the tax collector. Levi was the extortionist. Levi was the person who would break your leg if you didn't pay taxes. Levi is this, is this guy who, who, wasn't, who wasn't doing what we would think would be good. He was the most hated person in town. Matthew is who he became, who became the author of the book of Matthew. Matthew is this person who became the man of God, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and what, it, what, what we're seeing here, and what I want us to see in Matthew, is that God will go however far he needs to go and get whoever he needs to get, upset whoever he needs to upset, to save you. He will, he will go to the most hated person and save them, call them, and use them. He will go to, to the person who, who religion has doomed for hell. And he'll call them, and he'll save them, and he'll use them. He will go to the person who is the bottom of the bottom, the worst of the worst, worse than sinners. And he'll call them, and he'll save them, and he'll use them. People that you know, that you say God could never call, and God could never use, watch God do it. Just watch it. People that religion condemn, people that religion are saying going to hell, watch God work. Watch him do it. He'll call them, he'll save them, and he'll use them 2,000 years later. Just like he's using Matthew today. <laughs> now, what's interesting here is that Jesus expected Matthew to leave how much? Leave everything. He expected him to do that. <laughs> now, that's the emphasis of that verse that we read in, in Luke 5, 28. That's the emphasis there is that he's going to leave everything. It's going to cost him everything to follow him. <laughs> But he became uh, uh, an apostle. He's probably the only one who had any financial means of all of them. He's the only one that had any financial resources. But he left it all. He had a lucrative operation going on. Very lucrative. Making a lot of money. But he left it all. And see, it's not that massive with most people. But it was that massive with me. And with her. God called us, and we had to leave everything. We had a house paid for. I had a good job, made a lot of money. She had a good job, well-respected. We did really well. We did well at our jobs, and we, people liked us. We had our families there. Still are. <laughs> and, and we left it all. Sold the house that we had paid for, worked so hard to pay for, gave it to the church, gave the money to the church. 
That's why this church exists. We had to leave everything and come here 26 years ago. Now, it's not that massive with everyone. God's probably not going to ask you to do that. But he is going to ask you to leave something. There's something he requires us all to forsake. Something. What does he ask you to leave? What does he ask you to forsake so that you could follow him and do what he's calling you to do? It may not be something physical. It might not be a house or, or an occupation. That may not be it at all, but there's something. It can be a habit, a, uh, an addiction. It, it, it can be a relationship. But there's something that he is asking you specifically to leave so that you can do what he's asking you to do so that you can do something that's going to influence the kingdom of God, not just you and yours, but years and years down the road. What is it? Maybe he's dealing with you about something right now. Well, let this be a confirmation to you. God's calling you. God's choosing you, and he wants to use you. But to use you the way he wants to use you and bless you the way he wants to bless you, you've got to leave it. You've got to leave something and do whatever he's dealing with you in your heart. So what is it? What does he ask you to leave? What have you left? What is he dealing with you right now to leave? Uh, verse, uh, chapter 5 and verse 29 of Luke says this. Then Levi, after his conversion, after he followed Jesus, the next verse says this about him. Then Levi held a great banquet. That's a party, a great feast. Why? What, what does it say? For. Why, why do you do this? You need to say this. Then Levi held a banquet for Jesus. Do you see what this banquet's for? He's just not having a party. I think he is a party in publican. But, but, he's, a, but, he's, but he's having this, this big thing that's for Jesus. And I don't think it was his birthday party. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's like Jesus' birthday, so we're going to give him a party. It's, it's, there's something that he's doing that we learn learning about Matthew here. A party for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd came. Now, you've got to think about it. In those days, houses were 400 to 600 square feet. That's all they were, one or two rooms. But he had a great crowd in his house. His house was a lot larger than that. He had a big house. So he, he's giving into the house. He's, he's working in it with his house. He's in a large crowd of, of tax collectors and others. <laughs> and and Matthew, when, when Matthew wrote that, he wrote sinners instead of others. But Luke writes tax collectors and others eating with them. So another thing that we see about this Matthew Levi guy, this apostle, is he used the influence that he had to get others around Jesus. Others. You know any others? How many others do you know? You know some others? You know there's some sinners? <laughs> we, we all do. But what are you doing with your resources to get them around Jesus? What are you doing? What he did is he took his means, the, the, the means that he had, the, the finances that he had, the resources that he had, and he began to, to utilize that to bring others to Jesus, his friends, the sinners, the people. Let's get them around Jesus. Uh, when I taught this to you back then, I talked about a couple of times that I did that, uh, and I've never done it without there being some reward from it, some, some great benefit from it for the person to whom I was doing this for with. I told you about a time when I was working uh, at my occupation at that time and I came out into the parking lot and there was a man with a broken down car and his starter had gone out and that I had gone and, and tried to help him and ev initially we had to, to get him a new starter and he didn't have any money but I bought the starter for him and waited until he got his car running and, and then when he finally got it done he looked at me and he says, Dale, he said, he said are you going to church Sunday? And I said, yeah. He said, can I go with you? <laughs> I said, well, sure. And that week, Billy walked the aisle. He came and he received Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. That very week, had I not done that, Billy would have missed Jesus. What have you done? I talked to, to you about buying books for people and giving books for people or CDs or DVDs. You know, just t uh, giving them money, taking them out for a lunch or a supper. Just taking finances and resources that God's blessed me with and funneling them into others to bring them around Jesus. What have you done in your home? Have you invited people to your homes? What have you done to get people around Jesus? God wants us to do that, and, 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 and Matthew was good at this. Matthew was good at this. And, and I want to make one more point here. 
about, about Matthew Levi before I leave him and start talking about Thomas. But Matthew Levi, when Jesus called Matthew Levi, it upset a lot of people. They didn't get upset with Matthew Levi. Who'd they get upset with? Jesus. Now I want you to think about this. This is, this is interesting to me. You see, when God calls some people, it upsets some others. Because they don't understand it. It's not how they got it figured out. In Matthew 9, 11, it says this. When the Pharisees saw this, saw this party thing going on, saw this partying publican, and all this partying that Jesus is doing going on, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he do that? You see, this is what he's supposed to do. This isn't what a saved person, this isn't what a religious person, this isn't what the Messiah would do. And, and the way they had it all figured out is that Jesus was defiling himself by associating with these kinds of people. Imagine going to a party, adult beverages, party, no telling who's there, party. <laughs> See, selecting Levi was just off the hook. The Messiah they had coming <laughs> wouldn't do this. The, the Messiah wouldn't defile himself with these kinds of people. Oh, listen. Jesus not only called Matthew Levi, but he made Matthew Levi a leader in his church. Let's, let's get it. Think of the most hated person you know. The most hated person. Most despised sinner, bottom of the bottom, scum of the barrel. They go to church here, right? And I call them down, and I say, I designate you an elder. Now, first of all, all the elders would freak, but, but if I was to do that, I designate you an elder. Now, who would you get upset with? The guy I'm designating as an elder or me, right? And they were upset with Jesus. He not only called this guy... <laughs> Now he's making him a leader. This isn't right. And you can imagine what his apostles, the other guys, were thinking about this at the same time. But you know what? Jesus didn't care. He didn't care who he made mad. He didn't care who he set up. He's after Matthew Levi. Listen, he doesn't care who he upsets about getting you or calling you or choosing you. He's after you. He's after your kids. He doesn't care who doesn't like it. He's going to use you. So Jesus hears about this, you know. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus hears about this. And uh, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12 says this. On hearing this, Jesus said, <laughs> It's not the healthy who need a what? Doctor. Who need a doctor, but the sick. Now that makes sense to me, doesn't it to you? That makes a lot of sense. I don't really think about going to the doctor if I'm doing real well. He goes on. And he's talking about Matthew Levi, of course. But go and learn what this means. <laughs> I love it. He's, he's, that's a slap, an insult. I mean, these are the experts. These are the theologians. And Jesus is telling them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You know, slay all the cows and goats you want to. I don't care about cows and goats. I'm caring about Matthew. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come. Get it. <laughs> I have not come to call the righteous or the healthy, but sinners, the sick. I, I want to ask you. <laughs> and together are you a righteous person? we can change are you the sin sick Which Yes, together. Righteous meaning you think you're good enough. Righteous meaning that you got it together. You don't need Jesus. You're okay. You don't need church. You don't need praise. You don't need to give. You don't need to worship the Lord. You don't need to minister to people. You're okay. Sin sick means you realize you got some problems. And you, Jesus, came for 
and you, Jesus, can help. Uh, you know, uh, so many people in church think they're good enough. We call those people hypocrites. We know they're sin sick, but they think they're okay. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that he and church are not for people who believe they are good enough or righteous enough. It's for people who know they are not. Here's what it is. Here's what it's about. It's for people who know they are not. Church is for the sin sick sinner. Church is not for the club for the righteous. Church is for the sin sick. And when we pass by a church, we pass by this church. We pass by a church, we should point at it and say, there's a bunch of sinners. <laughs> right? I mean, if it's not, it's not a church. And you, you hear this, and sometimes we think that there's a lot of sinners in that church. Well, hallelujah! That's where I want to go! Right? I mean, we get it so religiously backwards. Lord, give me the sinners, because that's where I know you're going to be. <laughs> and he doesn't care who he makes mad doing that. Make all the religious people mad about the sinners in the church. That's okay, because he doesn't care about them. He didn't come for them. He came for Matthew. He came for me. I'm a sin sick person. And he came for most of you. <laughs> I hope all of you. You understand what I'm attempting to say there. Okay. Now, about 30 years after the ascension of Christ, uh, Matthew wrote his gospel. The gospel according to Matthew is the very first book you run into in the New Testament. You finish up Malachi, the Old Testament, and the first book you head on to, into is Matthew. This is Matthew's gospel. This is this man that we're talking about here. And what's so neat about Matthew's gospel is that it's, here, I'm going to say it, then I'll explain it. It's the most scripturally based gospel <laughs> that we have. <laughs> See, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of those are called synoptic, and they're, they're very similar. John is, is different. But, but they're all scriptural. But Matthew's uniqueness is that 99 times in his writings, he relates back to the Old Testament. He quotes or refers back to scriptures in the Old Testament because the Old Testament talked about Jesus coming. Here's what the Messiah is going to be. Here's what the Messiah is going to do. And so what Matthew does 99 times in his gospel is proves that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Jesus took this scum of the earth, this worse than sinner person, this extortionist, this most hated man in all the city. He took him, he called him, he drew him, he used him, he transformed him into Matthew the Apostle. Matthew who wrote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew's gospel still touching lives, yours and mine, even today. That's what God wants to do with every one of us. He wants to take us as low as we are. And some of us think that we're so low, God can't help us. No, I'm going to tell you. He'll go wherever you are, and he'll get you, and he'll bring you in. According to Wikipedia, Matthew preached the gospel to the Ethiopians in Egypt. He preached to the Macedonians, the Persians, the Parthians. And then he died as a martyr. martyr. He died in uh, uh, Natabar and in Ethiopia. And I think I'm saying this correctly with used, what was used to kill him was a halberd, halberd. What, what, if I understand this correctly, a halberd is a tool and it has a pick on one end and an ax head on the other. It has the ax on one side and a pick on the other. And there was Matthew faced with this halberd being hacked up, hands hacked off, legs, feet hacked off. They said, you will recant him or you will be hacked up. You will be picked, you will be stuck with this thing. There's Matthew. He won't recant. He won't refuse his belief in Jesus Christ. And they let him hack him to death. But he would not deny Jesus Christ. He would not stop preaching. What would you do? What would you do? You're faced with this. You probably never will be. But if you were, what would you do? Let's talk a little bit about Thomas. 
Thomas. <laughs> when you say Thomas, what is the first word or thought that kind of comes into your head? Anybody? Doubt. Doubt. Oh, whoa. We say doubting Thomas. Well, this is the guy who started it. This is the guy, when people call you a doubting Thomas, you blame him. This is him. This is the guy. <laughs> this is the thought that comes from him. And, uh, and we see something else. So Jesus will take a person so full of doubt, so full of unbelief, <laughs> and take that person and use that person to put them in the most unique group of people to change the world. You have any doubt in you? You ever struggle with doubt? <laughs> then you're going to like Thomas. Thomas was a negative person. You know any of those? See, uh, negative per people are downers to me. I mean, I don't like to be around negative people. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, some of you don't either, even though you are. <laughs> you don't like to be around them, even though you're like that. I, I read something or I heard this, that a negative person finds the manure in every meadow. You can be in the most serene place, the most beautiful place, flowers and birds and you can be in the most serene place in the whole world but the but the Thomas is <laughs> the negative person is going to find the pile of manure the flies the stink no matter how good it is they are the epitome of pessimist they 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 produce <laughs> they proclaim Murphy's law whatever can go wrong will go wrong that's their life rule. They're going to find it. They're cynics. They're pessimists. They anticipate and they expect bad things to happen. And some of you are like that. You might not be that way all the time, but I don't care what meadow you're going to walk in, you're going to step in the manure. You just have a way of finding it. <laughs> let's meet. Let's meet this guy. John eleven sixteen. 16. Uh, then said Thomas which is called Didymus. He's got another name too. <laughs> then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his whom? Who did he say this to? Who? <laughs> Am I putting you to sleep? Come on, wake up. Okay. <laughs> to his fellow disciples. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't need to do that. <laughs> to his fellow disciples, to his buddies, to his friends, to his fellow friends, you know, this is who he's saying this to. To his fellow disciples. Let us also go that we may what? Die. We're going to go, but we're going to die. <laughs> now, this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is what I mean. I'm going to set this up for you. But the die with him here, that's Jesus. There, so let me, let, me, let me set this up for you, tell you what's happening. In John chapter uh, 10, just before this specific thing happens in John chapter 11, in, in John chapter 10, Jesus had come into the area of of, uh, of, uh, of Judea because he's there for the Passover. The, this coming Passover will be when he will be crucified, arrested, crucified, and he will die. So he's coming, he's come down into the area. And he has preached, he's preaching out there in the area of Judea, and he has upset the Pharisees. I mean, he has really ticked them off. They have picked up stones. They're going to kill him. They're going to arrest him. They're going to stone him. But it's not time yet. He has to wait for the right time. The Bible says it wasn't his time, so he escaped from them, went back across the Jordan over there where they would leave him alone until it was time. Now, while he's over there in Jordan, he has these good friends, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, Martha and they live in Bethany, two miles, three miles maybe, southeast of, of Jerusalem. And this is where these people live, and Martha and Mary send Jesus word that Lazarus, their brother, is sick. Very, very sick. And if Jesus doesn't come, they're afraid he will die. So they send runners to tell Jesus. They tell Jesus in, Matthew, in, in John chapter 11, Lazarus is dying. You need to come and you need to come right now. The Bible says Jesus didn't go. In fact, he waited two days. Jesus let Lazarus die. Now, the disciples and the apostles were thinking that the reason that Jesus didn't go was because if he went, they would kill him. And not just kill him, they would kill them. They would kill the apostles as well. And so they thought this is why he didn't go. 
That's not why Jesus didn't go. After the two days passed, Jesus says, let's go. And they said, we ain't going. Lord, you, you forgot? <laughs> Listen, if we go, they're going to kill us. Lord, that's scary. They frightened us. They're going to kill you. They're going to kill us. No, we don't want to go. And Jesus says, well, Lazarus. And he says, he says well, Lazarus is okay. And it, finally Jesus tells him, Lazarus is dead. And they say, well, okay. If he's dead, he'll do fine. <laughs> In other words, we don't have to go. If he's dead, why, why go? Right? <laughs> and, and so at this time, at that moment, is when Thomas Didymus says, let us go. If he's going to die, if Jesus is going to die, we'll go and we'll die with him. Now, what I want you to see here is, is that he's a pessimist, but he's a brave pessimist, right? <laughs> he's negative, and he's hopeless. He has no hope. There's no hope in that statement. But he has, he has hopelessness with courage. Now, that's an oxymoron. That's about as, right, that's, that's, that doesn't go together unless you're a Didymus, right? And this is what I want you to see here. Thomas Didymus, who's, Thomas, who's also called Didymus. So let me show you this, uh, this Greek word, uh, Didymus, on, on there, just so you'll understand it just a little bit better. It's pronounced Didomus, and what it means is twofold or twain. Twofold or twain. Now, some teach this as that it means a twin, that Thomas had a twin. But it doesn't, didn't say that Thomas had a Didymus, right? <laughs> That's not what it said. It said Thomas who's called Didymus. I think it's that Simon Peter thing. I think it's that transformation that Jesus took all of his disciples through. And they transformed them from this to that. Th Thomas was Didymus. Thomas had this dual personality. At one time, it's total belief. Let's go! But we're going to die. It's, it's, it's like Simon, who was sometimes Simon, but then sometimes he's Peter. It's, let's go, even if it kills us. Let's go. And this is this, is this guy, Thomas, who is also called Didymus. And some of us are that way. We come in here on Sunday, you get pumped up, you praise God, you worship God, you raise your hand when I challenge us, and you walk out of here, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then you step in a pile of manure. We go fired up until Monday. We, 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 we get so pumped. We get so, we get so into it. We're going to be but men and women believing God can do anything. But there's just so much manure. We, we should be finding the faith and belief, but instead we start focusing on the manure. <laughs> we want to go. We want to do it. Even if it kills us. See, it's easy to believe when you're an optimist. If, if you're an optimistic type of a person, failure doesn't even enter your mind. You, you're not thinking about failing. You don't think that it can't work. It doesn't even come in there. But if you're a pessimist, it's the opposite. It's totally different. You can't really see it working because you're fo so focused on it not working. And this is what Thomas is. This is Thomas Didymus. We, 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 we learn, though, something amazing about this guy, Thomas. We learn something amazing. See, Thomas didn't want to live without Jesus. If you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. I love you that much. I want to be with you that much. If he's going to die, I want to die too. W would you have said that? Is that what you would do? You knew they're going to kill you. You had watched their anger. You had seen their faces. You had heard their voices screaming and yelling. And you knew they were about to kill him. And if they killed him, they're going to kill you too because you're, you're supporting him. What would you have done? Would you have sided with the other <laughs> disciples? Would you have decided with them and said, and said, I ain't going. <laughs> we, we don't, they're going to kill me. Or would you have sided with Thomas Didymus? 
Let's go and die with him. Here's the amazing thing, is that it worked. Thomas said that, and they all went. Every one of them. Okay, well, let's go. Let's go die with him. And what happened here is that they saw, to me, probably the most amazing miracle that Jesus did. Lazarus, raised from the dead. By the time they got there, he had been dead four days. By the time they got there, Martha and Mary came out to meet Jesus and took him to the tomb. Standing there in front of the tomb, he, Jesus says, roll that stone away. And they said, Lord, he stinks. Listen, he's so dead, he's rottening. He, he is so dead, he's stinking. He is dead, dead. They roll the stone away and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus did. And they saw that happen. They saw this dead, dead person come out. And he said, unwrap him. That stayed with them forever. And I think that's why they could face the picks. That's why they could face the axes. That's why they could face the spears. That's why they could face the crosses. Because they knew Jesus is God. They knew. You just don't tell somebody that's stinking dead to come forth and he do it. Now understand what I'm trying, you to, trying to get you to see is he loves his Lord. He's a pessimist. He finds the manure, but he loves Jesus. Some of you are that way. And it was a few days later. It's the Lord's Supper. That's what we call it. It's actually the last Passover Supper and the first New Covenant Supper. It's the, we call it the Lord's Supper. And Jesus has, has met with his guys and, and he's met with them and eaten with them and and, and done the communion thing, and now he's sitting, and he's talking to him, And he tells him, he says in, in, in John chapter 14, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you're going to come. And so he said this, and I want to read this to you in John 14, 4. It says this, you know the way to the place where I am going, Thomas said. Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Lord, we, we don't want you to go. Lord, listen, I don't, I don't want to be here without you. I don't know where you're going. I don't know how to find you there. See, Thomas loved his Christ. And, and he, he didn't want Jesus to leave. Thomas, Thomas would die with Jesus, but he wouldn't want to live without Jesus. I'll die with you, but don't make me live without you. Let me die. Just don't leave me. I want you to hear his heart, this guy, because it's going to set up the portion of Scripture that we all remember about doubting Thomas. It's his heart that I want us to see. See, Jesus did die, and Jesus did leave, and Thomas didn't. And Thomas stayed. Jesus, Jesus resurrected. But none of the apostles had seen him. The only ones that had seen him are the women who had been at the tomb that day. But they had relayed the message. And Peter and John had run to the, to the tomb and saw that it was empty. And then they called this mass meeting of all the apostles. Let's get together. We've got to figure this thing out. What's going on? So they were going to try to get everybody together. But Thomas didn't come. Thomas wasn't there. Now, it wasn't that they didn't invite him. It's that he didn't want to go. There's just too much manure. They crucified him. They humiliated him. They put him on that cross. They beat him. They stuck a spear in his side. They nailed him up there. Now you're trying to tell me I, I know what happened. Now you're trying to tell me that he's alive? No. I'm not going to meet with you. I'm, I, I don't want to meet with you. I'm depressed, and I want to be depressed. I want to be alone. Leave me alone. I don't want to eat anything. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to be with you. Just leave me alone. We've all been there, and this is where he was. He loved him. He loved him, and he just wanted to mourn. Read you this in John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas called Didymus, 
One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said to them, Unless I see nail marks in his hands, and not just see them, you're not going to trick me. You're not going to paint a spot there. I'm going to have to stick my fingers in it. Unless I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, you're not going to trick me. Put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. (laughs) You guys aren't going to fool me. I don't believe you. I, it, this, is, this is bad. This is the worst of the worst. This is the worst of the maneuver. A week later, John chapter 26 says this. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was there. Now watch, this is interesting. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Calm down, calm, calm down. It's me. Listen, if I'm in a house and the doors are locked and somebody walks through the walls, it better be Jesus. <laughs> and he better tell me really fast, okay, it's, calm down, it's me, it's me, it's me. <laughs> and I want you to see what's happening here. He, he, he comes in this room, he freaks them all out, and then he says, tells them to calm down and he walks straight to Thomas. He walks straight over to Thomas. He says, here, Thomas. Here's the holes. Put your fingers on. Go ahead. Put your fingers on. Here, Thomas. Go ahead. Stick your hand in there. I want you to know it's me. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And just don't look at it, Thomas. I want you to know it's me, man. Stop doubting. Stop seeing the manure, man. Find the meadow. Stop doubting and believe. What's interesting to me is that Jesus didn't rebuke Thomas. Now, he rebuked Philip. Remember, Philip, why don't you believe? He got all over Philip. He just went off on Philip. Oh, you've seen all this, Philip? Well, Thomas saw it all, too. But he just nailed Philip. But to Thomas, he's like so tender. Put your hands in it. Go ahead. Stick your hands in it. Stop down and believe, man. He was so tender with him. Just, Philip, I I know, I mean, Thomas, I know you're wired this way. You're Didymus. I know this is how you're wired, but man, if you're going to do what I've called you to do, and you're going to be what I've called you to be, you've got to stop seeing the bad in everybody, and you've got to start seeing the good. You've got to stop seeing the publican. And you got to start seeing Matthew. You got to stop seeing the sinner and you got to see the saved. You got to you got to do what I, if you're going to if you're going to really have a great life, you got to stop being negative. And you got to start being positive. Thomas was perhaps the only apostle who went outside the Roman Empire and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he uh, it's thought that he crossed the largest area of all of them. He traveled the furthest of all of them. He went to, to what is called the Parthian Empire, which is Iraq and Iran today. And he went to India. And today in India, there is a Bar Thomas church. <laughs> Bar Thomas, sons of Thomas. Bar Thomas church. And they say they go all the way back to Thomas. That it was Thomas who actually started that church in India. He died. Again, as a martyr, he was speared to death. See, there was no doubt in Thomas then. Thomas believed. What's interesting is is that Thomas did find the way to where Jesus was and to the place that Jesus had prepared for him. What is that place, Pastor? Well, let me show you the scripture because I think it's, it's so interesting. Luke twenty two twenty nine 29 says this. Jesus says, I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table 
in my kingdom. That's a pretty good place. And sit on thrones. Thomas has his throne. It's a pretty good place. Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> See, the amazing things that we're seeing today about a reprobate tax collector and a pessimist <laughs> doubter, <laughs> we're, 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 we're seeing that God can, can reach so far and draw so many and change so much. And every single one of us, we relate to these people. Jesus took these sub-common elite people and he transformed them into people who have changed our lives, who are responsible for our salvation, or at least for it being offered to us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for these amazing people that we're learning about who have done your will and your work and actually gave, gave their lives for it. Matthew, <laughs> who left everything, even his own life, for you. And Thomas, who believed so much that he went the furthest, taught the most, went to the furthest places he could possibly go so he could tell people about Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, how many of us relate to Thomas? Thomas Didymus. Sometimes we're so filled with faith, and then sometimes there's just so much manure. So we want to be men and women of God. We want to worship and praise. We want to be so bold in our faith, but yet sometimes we just say it's going to kill us. We want to, we want to, we want to do so much, but end up doing so little. How many of us relate to that? We know we get negative. We want to be positive, but we become so negative. And not only negative about church stuff, but about people. Instead of finding the good in people, we find the manure. Instead of finding the good in a situation, we find the negative. And what we would ask God to do for us today is help us find the meadow instead of the manure. Just leave the manure alone. It'll finally depreciate and go away. I want to concentrate on the meadow. I want to I want to focus on the good in people. I want to focus on the good in life, if that's you. And you say, man, I need help here. <laughs> Lord, help me today. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right where you are and just let me pray for you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't realize we had that many negative people here. But <laughs> Father, <laughs> Father, help us. Help us, Lord. <laughs> Lord, we don't want to be negative. We don't want to find the bad. We want to find the good. We want to find the meadow and not the manure. We want to we wanna love you, worship you, and praise you. We want to find the good in people. We want to minister to them. We want to be like Thomas. We want to go a long, long way and touch a lot of people. Heads still bowed and eyes closed. Maybe some of us relate more to Matthew. We're so far from God, you know, we just don't feel like he could ever reach us. We're not where we need to be with him. But we know he's calling us. But we've we're so messed up in life. We just, not even God can get, forgive me. Not even, you know, there's nothing. I, I, I know people, you don't, you don't, Delbert, you just don't know what people say about me. You know, you don't know, you don't, you don't, you don't know what they think about me. How many people hate me? <laughs> and you're nothing like Matthew. No matter how much you're hated or despised or how far you think you are from God or, or how, how low you think you've gone in life, you can't compare to Matthew. And God took this guy, he drew him, and he saved him, and he used him, and he's still touching our lives every Sunday just about. From the writings he wrote then, God can do that with you. He can save you, no matter how low you think you are. So if that's you, you know you're not where you need to be with God. You know, and you just want to be, you want to love him. You want to love him like Thomas, and you want to serve him like Matthew. You want, you want to be what God's called you to be, if that's you. You just know you're not where you need to be with God, and you'd love to be closer. Would you just slip your hand up right where you're sitting, and let me pray for you. See a hand here. Any others? Any others? Okay. Any others? See one in the back? Yes, I see you. 